Well, hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Ryan, for the generous and amazing introduction. Um, on, on this side, however, it's always a bit anxiety-inducing when you hear other people introduce you to an audience, um, because typically they only list your successes, not the failures um, or the near successes. So there's always a small moment of self-reflection in there um, as you think to yourself, like, I hope my lecture will measure up to that, to that expectation. So in all sincerity, um, thank you, Ryan, so much for introducing me and for inviting me to speak here tonight. I'm really excited to return to LA um, and to see how the school has changed over the last few years, to see the, the direction that it's taking, <clears throat> and to see so many familiar faces as well. Um, it seems like there are some incredibly productive and imaginative things happening here. So I'm really grateful to be given the opportunity to contribute to that energy in any peripheral capacity. So thank you again to the school for having me and to everyone that is here on a Friday evening, no less. Okay, so my talk today is titled Assemblies and Geometric Deviations, not to be thought of as two separate things necessarily. So assemblies refers to a kind of current mood of collective thinking in architecture and design culture, and the geometric deviations part is meant to encompass some of the unique ways in which my work deals with geometry as an expressive language, and like its title suggests, some deviations and alternatives from mainstream de design culture. As most lectures go, this one also has been organized into parts. I'll start off with a very short biographical perspective. I want to sort of go through um, a conceptual framework that looks at the contemporary status of digital tools and architecture. Then I will fast forward to now and look at how that framework has remained rather consistent, but also how it has de developed into some other alternatives, which will bring us to one of my recent projects. Um, I'll talk about that project through the lens of some light design theory, surveying the contemporary conceptual landscape of architects using digital tools to explore geometric organizations. And lastly, I will end with three quick back-to-back -back projects, an exhibition, an installation, and a pavilion. I hope at this point we can focus more on the practice component of the work. Um, I will not take too much time, um, as I know we're also very excited um, for the gallery opening tonight by Medium Office. <clears throat> so, the biographical bit. I received my MRC from SciArc, and I worked at Morphosis right after grad school for a couple of years. These are three of the projects that I contrib contributed to the most during my time there. Um, I was quite lucky, as um, two of these projects are actually built, which can be rare when you work in a design-focused firm like Morphosis. Um, I was also very fortunate to be on the computation and advanced technology team. Um, there were four of us there at the time, four women actually, um, who primarily worked on the design of facades and atrium spaces of all the projects that went through the office. In the very limited time that I had outside of work, I was often working on these multi-layered information drawings. This was an interest that sparked in me while I was still um, in grad school. At that time, I was really interested in vectors and vector-based information and how that, that could communicate painterly effects. When I was making these drawings, however, I was, strangely enough, influenced by building information packages. Um, I started to integrate annotations, which are typically only used for CD sets, prototyping, fabrication, and other construction or shop-related phases. In these works, I was interested in the aesthetization of that information as a visual exercise. Clearly, I was caught between these two worlds, as many of us just are just after school. So I was in this really immersive environment of computation and other digital tools as they related to practice, but also still very much engaged with experimental visual work. So I had a sudden urge to question this, this paradox. Here's part of the setup for the talk. Advanced digital technologies have most definitely influenced um, all contemporary architecture. There's no need to argue that, at least not in this lecture. Um, over the last 10 to 15 years, however, the emergence of visual programming and object-oriented programming paradigms, open source computing, and other accessible platforms have infiltrated architecture schools and offices at unexpected rates. This is a simple Google image search of projects that belong to those keywords. 10 years or so into that infiltration, these platforms have become powerful tools and environments. They have facilitated many great advancements in areas of optimization and fabrication, but at base level, however, these advancements might be considered more scientific than aesthetic. Outside of its scientific contributions, the emergence of code-based design in architecture did not work in parallel with other critical frames of reference. Code-based design typically did not engage with the discipline in, min in meaningful aesthetic, spatial, or visually focused manners. 
That kind of isolated and even hermetic mode of thinking can be seen in images like this other Google image search here. But this isn't as new as it may seem. Code-based design actually has precedence in visual art and art theory. In his now famous article, Systems Aesthetics, art theorist Jack Burnham addressed the influence of technological interferences with the advanced art of his movement, of his moment. He attempted to illustrate the cultural, cultural transition structured by the influx of technology by looking at minimal and conceptual art. In this paradigm shift, he argued that the te techno-cultural transition could be thought of as moving from object-oriented to systems-oriented ways of thinking and seeing. In other words, he sensed a shift in interest from things themselves to, to the way that things are made. Burnham argued that the modern aesthetic impulse needs to actively participate and relate to technological means of research and production. Fair enough, but architects might be, too might be too comfortable with this way of thinking. One could argue that in our present condition, the landscape of computation, broadly speaking, privileges the scientific and oftentimes lacks integration with platforms related to the visual. I think we went through a phase of widespread anxiety and frenzy after the first digital turn in architecture. There's been a lot of speculation and confusion as architects try to renegotiate a healthier relationship with digital tools and software. I mean, we're still going through that transition. However, I think we're at least past the adolescent years of that relationship and can now re-engage in that conversation in more productive ways. In my own critical reconciliation with a digital after school, I started to look at Mel Bachner's serial, serial attitude for alternatives. The critique I presented so far, um, the kind of like last like 10 to 15 years in design, is one where new styles have been developing haphazardly. There seems to be a kind of style war in both camps actually. So the history theory driven designers and the algorithmic ones. But it is refreshing to read Burnham and Bachner talk about the 70s in similar terms. In this essay, Bachner argued that the serial order is a method and not a style. I found this to be encouraging to read about a time when the art discipline was looking to withdraw from associations of style or maybe redefine new versions of it. Uh, maybe systems can be styles and styles can be systems. So in seriality, as defined by Bachner, um, which is a recurring theme of my work, so as a broad term, it's gener it, it is generally defined as a number of similar or related things that are structured in a spatial or temporal sequence. For Bachner, seriality is concerned with the order of things and not with their execution. He goes a step further from Burnham's earlier proposition. He further illustrated the role of this mode of thinking by separating it into two types. Artists that simply work in series and artists that embed a series-based methodology within one work alone. So here's what that looks like. And I hope that you find this as provoking as I do. Um, here are Willem de Kooning's women paintings, 14 of them among many, many more. So according to Bachner, de Kooning's investigation exemplifies work that is based on one theme with different variations. De Kooning painted the same subject with slight deviations each time, therefore creating a body of work related to, in this case, abstract expressionism. So we're in this realm of style. Jasper Johns, on the other hand, operated with simple logical propositions. His colored alphabet, as shown here, used conventions that have a beginning and an end. It's a closed system, a known closed system. Presumably everybody knows the alphabet, thereby establishing the work as serial within the artwork itself, embeddedly serial. This was a, a, a serial attitude, according to, pa, to Bachner, as opposed to style, which was the de Kooning example. Fast forward to the early 2010s, CNI, a theorist who writes extensively on aesthetics and culture, wrote a book on what she considers three primary dominant aesthetic categories. The most compelling one for me was her proposal for an aesthetic of difference, reappropriated from the 60s and 70s conceptual art movement, which Mel Bachner was, was a pioneer of. She describes this aesthetic project of difference as something that emerges out of variation, information, and even forensic evidence. In this diagram, she sketches out a parallel between literary theory and conceptual art. Her aesthetic of difference arose out of art criticism that looked at work which was no longer about virtuosity work that was instead about lists of data on objects, things, actions, and performances. Work that represents a break from classical art, expressive art, and the cult of like the singular genius or the singular art genius. So again, we're talking about things like conceptual and process art here. And here's how that works. Take Eleanor Antin's Blood of the Poet Box on the left. 
The box contained blood samples from 100 poets and an associated specimen list. Unting's work had a personalized nar narrative approach that resulted in collections of data. Ed Rocher's work on the, um, is another example that speaks to the same format. Stains, the image on the right, contains 76 stains from mixed media such as water, beer, blood, juice, and so on. Both of these artists' work exist as a type of collection, a set, an assemblage, thematically unified into a series by the concept of evidence or forensic-like information. Another famous example is a show curated by Mel Bachner, which included four identical binders that exhibited receipts, phone call records, purchase orders, rough sketches, notes, and other related documentations. Artists supplied this information, but not the actual works themselves. So lists of data are very well known to the computer programmer. In fact, it's the basis of any code to declare your variables. At a certain level of abstraction, conceptual art is actually not far off from writing code or scripting logics to generate some work. The systems approach of the work is therefore one that performs on the varying characteristics of units and the, repetitions, the repetition of these units to create a set. This automatically, especially in this exhibition, renders the work mathematical and spatial. So my argument through readings of Nye, Bachner, and Burnham is that serial modes might provide a certain kind of computation-friendly design discourse with a model for aesthetic evaluation. Nye, for example, argues that the relationships of units in a system can provide a form of, this, of aesthetic judgment, that for a work to be successful, it needs only to be interesting. This is Ed Roche's Very Small Fires and Milk. In this piece, Roche showcases a series of fires and one image of a glass of milk. The milk is the one, or the glass of milk, is the one unit that destabilizes the series such that it can offer another version or background by which to evaluate the relationship between all the images in the set. This is a series-based work that is hardly expressive in any conventional definition, but one that is undeniably interesting. So I wonder if certain strands of contemporary architecture might take cues from Nye's reading of, seven, of 60s and 70s conceptual art. So with that framework in mind, I'm now going to talk about one of my works that operates in a series and employs um, line drawings um, as, as clusters of visual content. This series, comprised of eight or maybe nine objects, depending on how you look at it, was part of my Muschenheim Fellowship exhibition at the University of Michigan Taubman College of Architecture. The ninth object, um, on the top right-hand corner, is inserted into the series as a deviation, or rather as a distraction, as something that, not unlike Rocher's glass of milk, can recontextualize the set. In the object version of the deviation, so the smaller image on the left, the drawing has been actually whited out and becomes like something more experimental and more subdued in its nature. Before I talk about the objects in more detail, I want to maybe elaborate on the drawing part a little bit. So as I mentioned earlier, I've always been interested in line drawings um, and the distinction between drawing as representation and drawing as information. Here, I was focused on the representational aspect of the drawing as it plugs into our current modes of visual production. Though there's a very slight undertone of digital information, which I'll talk to that um, a little bit more in a minute. So the use of the line carries with it a level of simplicity that is very important to my work. Somewhere between, the line, between line drawings and painted surfaces, these objects offer the visual effect of motion, tracing movements from picture support to the picture plane, therefore spatializing the line drawing. The topmost layer of these objects, the white line one, does the most work to create the illusion of depth while maintaining a three-dimensional sculptural effect. Although static in nature, the appearance of motion is mobilized by the directionality and continuity of the clusters of parallel lines, almost as if there are arrows that slowly guide your eye through these movements. The planar line clusters are not describing frames in motion, but rather traces of motion as they flow from one direction to the next. Although the clusters of lines bend and change direction frequently and at times overlay, they always maintain continuity. There are no endpoints in these compositions. The lines terminate at the boundary of the drawing or the boundary of the support. And by support here, I refer to Michael Fried's definition of painting support as in the host of the painting content, best illustrated by Frank Stella's shaped canvas works. So the lines never break. They, imp they imply a stream-like transition from one implied plane, in this example horizontal, to the next. These virtual planes are not in physical motion, but suggest movement. The continuous line transitions from one face to the next as it draws a composition that again reinforces the idea of tracing on a flat picture plane. 
Another important aspect of the work was the possibility of the line as atmosphere in an attempt to spatialize or architecturalize line drawing. So to illustrate this, the diagram on the left, as described by Rudolf Arnheim, demonstrates the ability and the desire of the eye um, as a visual apparatus to read movement as an extension of lines, here denoted by the dotted arrows, and not the actual movement itself, which is denoted by the solid arrows. It's of my opinion that Anthony McCall plays with his visual perception in similar ways. These diagrams, from meeting you halfway to, challenge the premise of the continuous line by juxtaposing two different ellipsoid forms within one another, but always maintaining an aperture between the two. As simple as a diagram may look geometrically, this motion is typically activated in space by the, by the materiality of light and fog. McCall likes to refer to his sculptures, sculptures as solid light works. I like this um, contradictory term because it speaks to the activation of 3D space made by simple lines and a kind of impossible materiality. The play of solid versus light simultaneously deals with the sensuous and the logical. Sensuous on the one hand, as the 3D volumes are made of light, one can puncture and close the apertures of the solid 3D light projection forms with your body. And logical, on the other hand, as one attempts to identify the emergence of the work. Is it the line? the film, the ground plane, or is the work only trigger, triggered by a person walking through it? McCall's work uses atmospheric conditions as one of the key factors in the play between drawing lines and making solids, so between 2D and 3D, between vertical and horizontal, thereby occupying and activating space in, pr in primitive and profound ways. In my ninth object, the deviation from this series, which I spoke to a little bit earlier, I simil similarly try to negotiate a play between line, depth, and space. In this example, the picture plane is slightly displaced and disoriented. It's firstly placed on the floor, and while it still maintains its verticality, it's slightly rotated and separated from its support to create another zone of spatial play. Distancing the, draw the drawing from the source of light is further enforcing the statement that the drawing is its own thing, yet activated by illumination in order to produce extra atmospheric effects, primarily within the plane that the drawing occupies and also the space between. Although Turalesque as an installation, this combination of white lines and white translucent lines produces an architecturally specific drawing that invites the viewer to observe it from different points in the gallery, revealing itself in time or slowly over time. The drawing has, I hope, been transformed beyond the pedestaled object and the pinned up drawing to an expanded field of spatial illusion. The lines are not only charged with producing effect tectonically, but also with creating compositional qualities in a flat bed picture plane, support, or in other words, frame. There are two things at play here, one competing for emphasis over the other. So on the one hand, this example attempts to have um, the physicality of the support embedded in the structure of the drawing. On the other hand, the drawing itself is framed in such a way that it simultaneously ignores the picture support and hopes that the perception of the image object can be flattened out. Another key factor in the construction of this balancing act is the dialogue between line and color in an attempt to dissipate the physicality of the surface that it occupies. There are typically five layers of color fills, line traces, and digital information in all of these drawings, each one playing an important role in the emergence of figures, misalignments, and other graphic effects. Looking outside the realm of architecture to the discipline of painting, I'm interested in the phenomena of edges. Some theorists claim that there are two fundamental categories of paintings, paintings that are based on line drawings and paintings that are based on the immediate application of color fills. So here, I'm specifically focusing on the application of pink, black, and white in my series. As architects started to adopt techniques from uh, painters in modernism, they challenged these conventions. Line drawings and renderings change from black lines that confined a boundary filled with color to implied white lines that described areas between fills. And this one, seemingly trivial, um, an example like the figure on the right can no longer be perceived as having a boundary, meaning that the boundary disappears into the optical field of the artboard or printed paper. In art conventions and mainstream drawing culture, white usually means something like a neutral void, as in the void of white plotter paper, which is very typical. In our words, um, there's no output, in, sorry, in other words, there's no output for the white line. It's simply an absence in which the paper shows through as a visual placeholder. In the art world, however, 
as drawing started um, gaining stature and autonomy in modernist and post-war art, white lines were not restricted to the same status. So to illustrate, Twombly engages the physical and the sub subsequent visual conditions of his drawing by using white chalk on a blackboard. Similarly, sculptor Fen Sandback draws lines in acrylic twine and uses interior architectural space as his medium. The series is a meditation on the articulation of the white line as a potential as it and its potential to exist in the real world. These are just a few experimentations that use lines as tool paths that remove material from solid stock in an attempt to create tectonic conditions where the line expands past its capacity for visual significance into the realm of the haptic. So my curiosities lie in this interchange between the physical and optical consequences of the white line as it emerges from our digital processes and workflows. This brief snapshot shows primary states the line exists in during the production of this drawing. The lines are first generated in Grasshopper and composed in Rhino, then transferred to Illustrator, then printed in each color, layer by layer, over and over again onto rigid material. The lines and the color no longer belong to the flattened image. They're now integrated with the properties of the printed, mat of the printed matter of the support. This diagram shows the layer structure of this particular drawing. The breakdown shows the structural logics responsible for the assembly of the line and color information. The very first printed layer to the far right is a solid white fill that functions as a mask to hide and reveal two different states of material transparency. The rest of the layers are then sequentially built on one on top of the other until the final figure emerges, thereby establishing a clear route from the virtual to the real. The aesthetic objective of the scaffold, however, almost forges an intimate relationship between structure and form. The white fill layer to the far left, or in other words, the mask, is the first mark that creates a figure in the field. The second layer, the first layer of white lines, the second image to the left, conflates the figure and ground by gently, gently softening the edges of the explicit outline of the figure from the first layer. The first two layers then solely service the substructure of the final figure. The role of the color is to further codify the areas of varying translucency of the material. The drawing component, which is made of two layers, the black lines and the white lines, is then finally printed also as separate layers, but would not have the same visual effects without the, const without the construct of the color line materiality I just described. So, I wanted to give you the whole picture of the physical manifestations of these drawings as a tool to expose the capacities of the line beyond drawing and representation. These drawings play with notions of repetition, similarity, variance, reliefs, and other ideas that respond to the visual field in terms of optical and logical consequences. In particular, the drawings become especially engaged as the white lines echo the composition underneath the black lines, and as they modestly wrap around the underlying support. The ghostly traces of the figure sometimes comes together as a whole and at other times remains separate, separated as distinct layers. Although there are many optical and technical variables in play here, as I've shown, the final work still operates in response um, to the collapse of painting and drawing in our contemporary culture of architectural representation. The architectural drawing as a type is in like a weird place as we blur categories and lines between what is instructional, representational, process-based, and purely driven by technique. Okay, so lastly, as a continuation and sometimes deviation from this research, I'm going to quickly show three projects, two of which are in collaboration with Hans Tersat. This project, a collaboration with Hans, is titled Transfers. It's located in a sculptural park called Art OMI in Ghent in New York. It's about three hours north of New York City, not far from the town of Hudson, it's up for two years, so next time you're in New York, I highly recommend you make some time to visit Dia Beacon, Storm King, and OMI. So the basic premise of the project is that the piece should read like a proto-architectural massing study. In our conversations with a curator, we decided that it should read like an urban tower sited within the woods. These are two of the primary sources of inspiration for the project. The image on the left is taken from a 19th century German textbook on crystal formations. The image on the right is from a really extraordinary show of Michael Heiser's work um, at the Whitney Museum in 1985 called Drag Mass Geometric. In the exhibition, Heiser, Heiser built massive stereotomic forms out of aluminum scaffolds and corrugated boards. The panels are, are silt screened with abstracted images that Heiser took of the southern, of south, sorry, 
the southwestern landscape. So contextualizing and abstracting landscape graphics on the interior of a gallery. From a formal perspective, the aim of the project was to reconcile a crystalline faceted geometric massing study with a line work 2D drawing. In the form, you can read the influence of Heiser and Tony Smith, um, and the graphic was inspired by Agnes Martin's systemic compositions, but also the elevations of urban towers at night, as seen at night. This is a form generation diagram of the piece. So here the idea was to nest two volumes inside one another. On the second row of the drawing, you can see a carving operation on the outer volume to reveal the inner figure. And on the third row, a sequence of compressive forces that begin to crush the volume in on itself. We're really interested in stereotomic expressions, but when it comes to actually making this piece, it is made out of thin planes, just as Tony Smith and Michael Heiser's work is often made out of plywood or thick board. This project was sponsored by Corian Solid Surfaces Materials, and we created um, a quarter inch uh, water jet aluminum structure to support the Corian panels on the outside. Following some of the fellowship work that I showed earlier, each panel of the piece is printed using a flatbed commercial sign printer. Um, the piece was designed to be flat packed and shipped into the back of a small van. Uh, so there's always the kind of like economic justification for some of these works but also it's designed like a giant uh, model or a kit of parts that can be assembled at any time. Um, these are the connection details where the aluminum water jet structure meets the printed and milled Corian. We thought it was important to actually express the hardware and show the connections between the parts and the different material systems. It should read like a continuous shell from far away and like an assembly of parts from up close. One of the better views is actually um, on the back of the piece. Here you can see how the graphic map sort of like misses or skips off the Corian massing. This is another theme of the work in the talk, how a graphic map talks to its three-dimensional support or frame, as explained earlier. So the conversation between drawing, material, and material assembly is what hopefully motivates the viewer to study it in the round in the 360. In the second project, uh, part of my ongoing research of graphic line operations is titled Poppy Red. This work will be exhibited at the K Pink Comma Gallery in Boston in September this year, so it's still ongoing. Um, I originally started working on this drawing, or on this project, as I was writing a piece on discrete geometries and the reappraisal of the digital for the AD magazine, which will be out in print in April. In this article, I re-articulated um, seriality as analogous to network theory, best postulated by Bruno Latour. The image on the left is a drawing study by Aranda Lash, and the image on the right is an installation by Thomas Sarasano. The former illustrates a sort of geometric exercise that is actually embeddedly serial. It uses linear, a linear unit, varying lengths and orientations of that unit, and composes it in a sort of centrifugal manner from an almost center point, therefore creating an assembly of units. The latter uses filament to create a network-like structure that represents a flat ontological system. Latour argues for non-hierarchical order with localized clusters, but not necessarily clusters that create a happy whole, rather parts that create a composition, a network. The project works through the serial attitude as defined earlier. The series is less concerned with the final project than it is with relationships between different parts and different artifacts within that project. The series, however, is more tightly focused on self-similar clusters of lines and varying planar compositions, um, as is shown on this particular phase here. With these drawings, I also started to work with line densities and how they could produce different graphical effects. So this is one drawing in the series. As mentioned before, my work is interested in the medium of architectural drawing and modeling sim simultaneously. So Poppy Red, in this case, it's hyperformal and focuses on line networks, so clusters on line segments, and also volumetric operations. The images and models borrow drawing and printing procedures from graphic and industrial design. So you can think of here as like slick, high finish commercial processes like hydro dipping films and flatbed printing. In Poppy Red, the line drawing component takes on a graphic role shown on the panels to, um, on the right diagram, which sometimes aligns with the formal transformations of the volumes in a coherent way, but at other moments challenges the sculptural qualities of, the, of those forms in favor of the graphic figures, which can be illustrated here with the planar graphics that skip the form. So this is a zoomed in view of one of the larger models. 
And this is an overall view of that same model. So Poppy Red employs a serial working methodology and includes multiple sets of drawings, models, and this large scale sort of final moment model, uh, meaning that the series and the models are meant to be seen as a snap moment in the development of the work and not as a kind of like finalized work. Things to take note of here is the relationship between graphic, ar graphic artifacts and fragmented, geologically infected, inflected volumetric organizations. The project is an attempt to discover new relations between contemporary visual trends and disciplines peripheral to architecture proper, so like graphic design, animation, printmaking, and the built environment. Though abstract and experimental, the studies are still in their very initial stages, the series is meant to investigate visual principles that could be extrapolated into full-scale architectural proposals. So here is their, their hints of Agnes Martin and Fred Sandback again. While the work relies on advanced digital tools borrowed from architectural computation and animation and film industry, so you can think of here like the, Z, the ZBrush 3D painting environment, um, it also takes cues from post-war art, art theory, and contemporary architecture. You can think of these um, as rigorous investigations into the structural spatial properties of lines. So as a design proposition, Poppy Red's geometric agenda is indebted to concepts put forward by more contemporary designers like Andrew Zago and his notion of architectural accident, and sculptors like Carol Bove, her carefully calculated sculptural contortions and investigations of geometric, geometric posture. Okay, so geometric postures, line networks, tectonics, surface articulations, and so on, um, they can all be kind of like illust illustrated and come together here at a sort of like larger scale. This project, so this is in collaboration with Hans Sersak as well, um, this next project is currently in the prototyping and development stage. We presented our final design in January, and the piece will be constructed in August. The pavilion is for the upcoming Exhibit Columbus exhibition in Columbus, Indiana. Many of you may know about Columbus. It's a mecca of modernist and postmodern architecture. The town has works by Venturi, Deborah Burke, I.M. Pei, and, and others. Our piece is going to sit right in front of Eero Saarinen's First Christian Church in a landscape designed by Dan Kiley. When we put our initial proposal together over the summertime, we started with two lines of inspiration, sort of like two conceptual drivers. First, we wanted to imagine a series of architectural forms as wireframe or skeletal constructions, volumes read as lines in space. The second thing we wanted to explore was how architecture might give shape to abstract natural systems. So we were thinking about ways that we, in popular culture, conventionally exhibit natural history and ecological networks. From a formal perspective, we looked at artists that work with skeletal frames. The question for us was, can an architectural structure be expressive? And again, there's also this kind of um, form as a diagram of forces idea at play here. A question that I like to think about is, can one compose with physics? Can one subject, sub, can one subject a form to virtual or simulated gravity as a way of generating schemes? Thinking about the pavilion program over the summertime, we were reading a number of philosophers interested in materialist and ecological theories. So thinkers asking abstract questions about our relationship to inanimate things. Part of the reason we wanted a more visually porous massing is driven by other major elements of the project, its program as a full-scale vivarium or terrarium. So the basic material idea for a pavilion is that we are co-opting ready-made assembly logics from greenhouse kits. So a combination of off-the-shelf components and machine precision fabricated parts. The actual enclosure will be clear, structured polycarbonate panels. The panels will be cut to match the primary and the secondary structural elements of the frame. On the interior, we've designed a planar arrangement of planters, information boards, artificial lighting, um, and fabricated terrain. During the day, we hope that the installation will be a site of natural encounter and social gathering. And during the evening, the structure will be illuminated from within. So here we were inspired by the glass volume on top of Deborah Burke's Irwin Union Bank. If you haven't been to Columbus, uh, you might have seen the film. You can see a continuation of some of our earlier work here in the geometry of the pavilion's massing. So this interest in, in faceted, stereotomic forms rendered in lightweight structural systems and rendered skins. Turning to issues of fabrication, we're designing the pavilion's frame as a kit of interlocking flat, digitally fabricated components. 
Um, we've been very fortunate, yet again, to receive corporate sponsorship from Autodesk for our project. Um, as research residents at the Build Space in East Boston, we're now developing prototypes and, and two bending workflows for the structure's frame. So the plan is to fabricate the structure using um, CNC two bending machine at the Autodesk build space. Each frame will have a connection logic uh, built into its own its, its geometry, so it's not two separate systems. Again, we want to minimize labor intensive on site assembly processes, such as like precision welding. So, our plan with that economical framework in, in mind is to fabricate the panels such that the entire or fabricate the entire thing so they can be flat packed and transported to our site. In this drawing, you can see us working to optimize the amount of unique radii at each frame's bending moments, for example. Our fabrication thesis um, is that digital tools can easily accommodate for an infinite variety of unique parameters, like radii, length, and you know, surface areas, and so on. But for our interest in research, we are aiming to land somewhere between standardized production and 100% 100, um, custom fabrication. So, we see the pavilion as a model for something that is potentially scalable with this idea of like architecturally formally driven forms um, and a kind of like social gathering um, on the interior as its program. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. <laughs>